news and information directly from the source. In this edition of Health Impact News Direct, we will be examining food freedom and what it means to those of us who seek to buy the best quality food we can from the sources of our choice. people from Maine and from North Dakota and sharing what they told me about the efforts they have made to bring food freedom to their states. The first comments will be from Leanne Harner, who is a farmer from North Dakota. She'll be sharing what food freedom means to her. Well, you know, food freedom is ultimately about taking care of your health and having access to the products you want to have access to without the government saying this is a good product, this is not. You know, we believe that individuals can decide if this is a person from whom they wish to purchase fruits, vegetables, meat, dairy, whatever, or if it's a person that they would just as soon not buy food from. And and that is your personal choice for you and your family. For many years, and even now, we've talked about you know, restaurants advertise homemade pies or, or, you know, homemade soup or whatever, and homemade was the hallmark of something good and special. And yet, in many cases, if you want to make soup and you want to sell it to your neighbor, it's illegal. Now, why is homemade so much better, and yet we say it's illegal to sell it? Food freedom is just about getting consumers and producers the, product, the opportunity to have a free and fair exchange of products. When did the food freedom movement start in North Dakota? Well, actually, the food freedom movement really got its start after the election last fall. Um, so this has been pretty uh, short-lived. I, I, was in, I was involved um, in November, right around Thanksgiving, and uh, got a hold of Representative Simons, who is the person who sponsored our legislation. And he and a, and a community organizer by the name of Jared Hendricks and I kind of spearheaded getting the bill um, put into format and getting the, just putting together the sponsors and working on all of this. So really just since last November. There are a number of aspects to food freedom. They include the sales of fresh fruits and vegetables, raw milk, dairy products, baked goods, home prepared foods, and the odd farm processing of various meat animals, such as chickens, beef, and pigs. Which of these are part of the North Dakota food freedom law? Well, we already had the chicken slaughter law on the books. um, And most of our fruits and vegetables, we kind of standardized things. But for the most part, we had some pretty good laws on that part. We don't allow the sale of raw milk or raw milk products. and, And we haven't done anything as far as the sale of red meat products. But everything else is pretty much open now with our new food freedom law. Do you plan on addressing the raw milk portion of this in future years? Absolutely. We're, we were really disappointed we didn't get raw milk through, so that's number one on our list. Um, we're going to go back through and do any little tweaking that we find, um, you know, any problems that we have with this law that we need to tweak and, and maybe include some items that we didn't include before, like rabbits and fish. We, we hadn't included those in, so we want to do that. And we've got some ideas for some other things that that may come up, but we're still working on those. What kind of opposition did you face? Well, the opposition was pretty sure there'd be a raw milk bill at some point. Uh, And and it was mostly, it it was the bureaucrats and primarily the health department that we had to fight. Um, We had some grocers that took exception to us, and the Veterinary Medical Association was not happy with the raw milk portion, and they had some... And so they fought it a little bit, not too much. And we had a few milk producers that came in and and weren't happy about the idea of those of us wanting to sell raw milk off the farm. Uh, but but um, in general, it was the health department and uh, and the various health districts around the state that really were our strongest opposition. What was the nature of their opposition? Oh, that that. Uh, people were going to die, and especially children. We were going to feed them this food that hadn't been approved, 
and oh my goodness, why we know there's dirty home kitchens out there, and what if somebody bakes a loaf of bread or makes a cream pie and they don't transport it properly, you know, they just leave it out and they never refrigerate it, and a kid gets a hold of that and gets sick. Why, that was just, foodborne illness was their big bugaboo. How did you counter their arguments? Well, we went back through 27 years of foodborne illness records in the state. They were the ones that were available on the Department of Health's website and just looked at the instances where there was foodborne illness that they thought was based in a home. Of course, most of those cases that they report are never, they never get a definitive source. They just have suspect foods. And I think there was one case where home baked goods were a problem. And we just pointed this out to legislators. We said, look, this really isn't, a, isn't much of an issue. We all go to school bake sales. We go to church functions where the food was made in the home. And, it, and we just really don't have outbreaks of foodborne illness. So, you know, at some point, common sense has to prevail. And that really did sell with the legislature. I will be sharing additional comments from Leanne Harner at the end of this podcast. At that point, she'll be explaining how we can work with the legislative process to establish food freedom laws in our own states. The battle for food sovereignty takes place really in two forms. The first is top-down, and the other is bottom-up. In North Dakota and Wyoming, the top-down approach was used to establish statewide laws. In Maine, we see the bottom-up approach. Individual towns have established food sovereignty ordinances to provide food freedom for their residents. This is made possible by a provision in the Maine Constitution which establishes home rule. Eighteen towns in Maine have used the Home Rule Amendment in the Constitution to establish their own food sovereignty ordinances. Mainers are now working to establish statewide food freedom laws. I interviewed Heather Retberg, a farmer from Maine, who explained how this process began. Well, in 2011, a number of us, um, so the ordinance, the original ordinance called the Local Food and Community Self-Governance Ordinance was drafted at my kitchen table, actually, Mm -hmm. um, with a number of our customers, a few lawyers, uh, other farmers, farm workers, um, and that we were really working on in 2010 in response to some of the things that were happening at the state level. And then in 2011, um, four of our towns here that are neighboring towns Um, all had uh, the ordinance on our town warrants in 2011, and three of the four first towns passed um, the ordinance uh, that that first spring. So that was the first first year, and then the second year, another um, four or five towns picked it up, and then each each year since there have been a few more towns, I think with the largest being again in uh, 2016. There were five towns that adopted it then. And this year, there are another three towns that are um, underway right now and another half dozen that are considering either special town meetings or um, or working on it for next, next spring's town meeting cycle. How do you address the arguments being raised by food-related corporations and various regulatory bodies that food freedom is going to make people sick and kill our neighbors? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's really easy, actually. I mean, in our communities, I, I live in a town of um, about 1,200 people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we really still operate in very many ways on handshake integrity um, and on direct feedback loops and accountability. So if there's any kind of quality issue with anything that we're doing at our farm, you know, our customers come right down our driveway. They stand in my kitchen while I'm packaging their cheese. Uh, you know, they feel very open to telling me if there's if there's an issue um, that would need to be addressed, and and then we can address it very very quickly and, and directly in that in that way. Um, and and I think that um, in in general, our our farming community is one of high integrity, and and 
you know, nobody starts selling food without knowing what they're doing and educating themselves about um, if food safety. I don't think anybody cares more about food safety than, than the, the farmers and small food producers. I understand that you've been testifying before the Maine legislature about two food freedom bills. Can you tell us about your reception? Some of the things we just recently heard um, in the processes in Augusta by the by the corporate food lobby was they're sort of shifting their tack now and instead of saying that we're, we'll make people sick um, <laughs> because we're not careful now they're saying well we know we know that they don't mean to and then they're very well meaning but but basically there's no no way they could inform themselves and educate themselves without an annual inspection mm -hmm. so you know, it's sort of a, I think it's just a very silly argument, the, the inspections in, in reality. You know, we have, of course, farming friends that are licensed and, and sell raw milk in, in some of the stores. And one day, ironically, when I came home from Augusta from one of these public hearings, listening to what um, our Department of Agriculture and the grocery and dairy lobbies were saying that, you know, without this monthly sampling of the milk. There's no feedback. There's no way you can tell if what you're doing is safe. And so I shared that with our, our licensed dairy farming friends, and they just laughed. They said, that's such bunk. The inspector that comes to our farm doesn't know what she's doing. We have to educate her. Mm -hmm. And she hasn't been here in eight months. So the system, even as they say it exists, doesn't really exist, especially in Maine. We don't have enough um, inspectors to um, to come to all the farms, anyways. But mm -hmm. also, it's it's usually the other way around. I think that the farmers are the ones educating the inspectors and are are very knowledgeable about food safety and, and animal husbandry. And it's usually when they talk about food safety in the state capital, they're talking about stainless steel, how many drains you have, making sure you have three sinks and not just two. Mm -hmm. But when we're thinking about food safety, we're really thinking about animal husbandry that begins by tending the soil to make sure that our soil is biologically active and um, is going to be growing healthy food for the animals, which in turn will be healthy, and that our you know, food safety is really beginning with, with soil health and animal health. Has the Maine Department of Agriculture received any complaints regarding food-related illness or food-related death? No. Okay. No, and I mean, that was part of, um, you know, especially going back to 2010 and 11, that was the question that we were asking the department. Why, you know, why now are you changing uh, the rules, changing how we're defined when there hasn't been any foodborne illness outbreak? And mm -hmm. um, that was actually one of the questions one of the legislators asked. They had at the department during these uh, most recent public hearings, if there had been any, they were asking specifically about raw milk, had there been any illnesses or deaths reported from raw milk in the state of Maine? And there hadn't been, and that was the department's own admission. So, um, and now, you know, we do have, if you want to call it a um, six-year track record with all of these communities passing local ordinances to essentially continue exchanging the food the way we always have. And, you know, not, of course, nothing is... Um, Nothing has come up. How would you describe yourself? Oh, well, um, so I'm a homeschooling mother and a farmer. We have about 100 acres where we, um, it's a grass-based livestock farm um, where we have a, a small herd of uh, dairy cows and goats, laying hens, meat chickens, pigs, and then I guess over the last six years or so, I've been one of the leading food sovereignty advocates in the in the state. And I think you said you also make uh, cheese? Yeah, we do some value adding to our milk. We make yogurt. My husband makes yogurt, and I make the cheeses. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. you, sell, you sell at farmer's markets? We actually don't. We sell right here from the farm, right uh, from our farm store. Mm -hmm. And then we have a couple of private buying clubs. Um, where I just send out a weekly email uh, letting our customers know what's available and they order and um, then we have a, a meeting spot and we only pack up what's been ordered 
and they come and pick it up, and then everybody's back on their way in 20 minutes. So right now it's just my husband and I and our children who, mm-hmm. um, you know, run our farm. So um, it's a lot. It, it keeps us both here able mm-hmm. to be working on the farm more if we're not um, at the longer kind of farmer's markets. The next series of comments are from Betsy Gerald, who is also from Maine. She describes herself as a professional political activist. She has been helping communities who are interested in food sovereignty and will be sharing some of her experiences. She will also explain why the food sovereignty movement is truly a nonpartisan issue. My first question for Betsy Gerald has to do with the political climate in the Department of Agriculture. Is the Department of Agriculture always against food sovereignty? They're dead set against any legislation at all. Um, I was in a hearing about um, they were doing a bill to um, in the in the Agriculture Committee. They were doing a bill about um, funding food banks and give like five million dollars to do um, infrastructure so that food local food banks could have refrigeration and that they mm-hmm. had better trucks trucks to transport the food around and. And the the uh, the department stood up to testify against that. So basically, they're standing up to testify against hungry children. Mm-hmm. And Danny Martin, who's one of the senior um, representatives from up in the county, and he's just a card. But he looks at the at the representative from the department. And he says, "You know, I haven't been on this this committee for very long, but you guys are batting a thousand. You've testified against every bill that's come before this committee, mm-hmm. and it's true. They do. They just stand up. You know, it's like." They don't want anything to change. They love the status quo. It's working just great for them. Is it correct to say that communities in Maine that adopt the Food Sovereignty Ordinance are basically saying, we have the right to make our own decisions without interference from the state? Mm -hmm. Um, Or the the USDA. mm -hmm. I mean, the... the, Mm -hmm. The reason, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the reason that the State Department of Agriculture fights it so hard is because all of their, a lot of their funding, is, and especially the funding for their food mm-hmm. testing laboratory, mm-hmm. it comes straight from the feds. Mm-hmm. And if they don't do what the feds tell them, they're mm-hmm. going to lose their funding. And they mm-hmm. can't afford it because they can't afford this, you know, $3 million mm-hmm. lab. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or they think they can't anyhow. It seems that those who oppose food sovereignty are promoting an agenda of fear. They're they're basically saying, watch out. Locally produced food is dangerous. That's what all of the argument is about, is that that if we let small farmers feed their neighbors, they're going to kill them all Mm -hmm. with food poisoning. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what they keep saying. And, And I... I got rather snippy in my testimony this time. It's like, you know, I, t- I t- called it slanderous to mm-hmm. say that small farmers are, would poison their neighbors. So, as I understand it, 18 towns in Maine have declared themselves free of regulation of the selling and buying of local food. Is it correct to say that they'll continue using this freedom until such time that the state of Maine sues them? The state, both the state department and the Maine Municipal Association, if the ta- if a town passes the ordinance, they get a letter from those two entities that basically says, you know, this isn't legal. Mm-hmm. And and most and all of the towns have chosen to ignore those letters. Mm-hmm. So, um and I don't foresee the department ever suing a, t- a town, you know, they might they might decide to to sue another um, producer, mm-hmm. especially because of the way that the Supreme Court ruled in the Dan Brown case. Mm-hmm. I think they kind of know they don't really have a leg to stand on. So you know, so the, the in the eighteen towns, people are selling food amongst themselves with no interference. How would you characterize your work as an activist in the food sovereignty movement? We 
don't go in and say, we're not AstroTurf. We don't go in and say, hey, guys, you should have this ordinance. We, mm-hmm. we, you know, we put it out there. The information is out there. If, if people hear about it by word of mouth or on social media, they come to us and say, we would like to do this. And we say, we will help you in any way that we can. Um, we usually encourage people to have some public meetings, public hearings ahead of time in their mm-hmm. town and then take it to town meeting. Is this a partisan issue? Well, no. I mean, I, th- this is one of the things I love about doing this work is that it really seems to cut across the political spectrum. I mean, I'm about as far left as you can get. I'm a former Green Party chair and, mm-hmm. and um, you know, pretty my, – my politics are very uh, – liberal and progressive and mm-hmm. and and but I you know I'll go into a room into a public hearing or into a room of people that are thinking about um working on the ordinance and it'll be everything from way left to way right I mean we've got a lot of libertarians who are very mm-hmm. interested in this mm-hmm. in this um uh movement it's farmers and it's um there's a big foodie movement here in this in in Maine so mm-hmm. there it's the foodies are are um Part of it, the core group is, um, you know, I'm I'm a professional political activist. Heather's a farmer. Bonnie's a retired librarian. Hendricks a retired um, academic. A little bit of everything. A little bit of everything, yeah. yeah, yeah, which is great. I mean, that's I love this. You know, we talk about we talk about finding issues that cut across the political spectrum, and this is definitely one. There aren't very many topics that I can go into a room and talk to a bunch of Trump supporters about. But as I say to them, you know, we all eat. Mm -hmm. The lucky of us eat three times a day. Mm -hmm. And this is important. We should be able to source our foods where we want to source them. In this final section, we'll be returning to comments made by Leanne Harner from North Dakota. She'll be sharing what she learned about how to get food freedom legislation passed in her state. So, Leanne, was there something special about the state of North Dakota which allowed this law to get passed so quickly this year? I would say, John, that, you know, all states are special, and certainly I think North Dakota's special, but really any state, I think, could pass this type of legislation in some format. Um, Food freedom is something that rang and and was good in our House of Representatives. By the time we got to the Senate, they're a little more old guard. So we use the phrase cottage food bill, and that seems to resonate a little bit better. One of the things that worked for us is that North Dakota has 28 different health districts in the state that actually have different rules about things. So for example, you could go to one city and sell your eggs at a farmer's market but you couldn't go across the river to the sister city and sell your eggs there. It was allowed in one spot and not the next. The same with a lot of different foods, not, not fruits and vegetables, but a lot of processed foods. And legislators understood that that was very difficult, not just for the producers, but also for the consumers to follow that. So having those districts um, with conflicting rules and being able to pass something that unified that so those districts can't have conflicting rules, really resonated with the legislature, and I think it, that, that worked in our favor. Are the health districts organized by county? They have, some of them are county, um, have county boundaries, some are multi-county boundaries. And the, the restrictions varied wisely. In, for example, a guy selling fruits and vegetables in one city couldn't sell, couldn't, deliver those fruits and vegetables to a restaurant. But if the restaurant came to the local farmer's market in the same jurisdiction, he was allowed to sell to the restaurant. Now, that's just a silly rule. And with food, with the food freedom bill, we were able to make it so anytime you want to sell fresh, unprocessed fruits and vegetables, you can sell direct to a restaurant or, or to the consumer. The process to bring food freedom to North Dakota began in November of 2016, and in just a few months, North Dakota established its food freedom law. What can you tell us that would help our efforts to bring food freedom to our states? Well, the first thing I do is start early. Don't don't uh, 
expect that you can push something through necessarily as fast as we did. It was just a, a combination of factors that made it happen. Today is not too soon to start and start building a database of contacts, especially if you can build them by legislative districts, because then you've got the people in the local area that can make the calls to particular legislators. Expect that you're going to have strong opposition and there's going to be dirty tricks. So, you know, they're going to bring out all sorts of bugaboos about all the people that are going to die or all the people that, are, that could get sick. And you just have to be prepared for that. You have to research, research, research foodborne illnesses and get out in front of it. You know, just be very frank with, with your legislature or your policymakers. Yes, you know, foodborne illnesses exist. It's going to happen even in inspected places. So, you know, we are going to do as much education as we possibly can and, and understand the statistics so you are out in front and you can just, you know, be very frank that, that we acknowledge this is a risk, but, you know, all life is a risk and we're adults. We want to be able to get these foods. Involve consumers as much as you can and the press. And our, our press was really generally pretty favorable here to the idea of food freedom. You need, I think, a core group of two to three people who are spokespeople as well as decision makers. And you need to empower those people so when they're talking to legislators and an amendment comes up, they can kind of say yay or nay right on the spot. Um, you know, things can happen very quickly with the legislature and sometimes you have time to stop and think about it and evaluate. But Many times, you just really need to have that reaction and, and to make a decision there. And, and that core group of people are important to your, to your whole organization. And I guess, you know, talk about what is and isn't acceptable. Um, and understand that right up front. What are you willing to bend on and what are you willing to, you know, what do you have to stand firm? And if you know that and your spokespeople know that, then you can make your decisions fairly easily. And I guess the final thing is, if people are interested in doing it, this in the state, they can certainly contact me, they can contact Wyoming. We leaned on, on Wyoming a lot. And, uh, you know, those of us in food freedom states would love to help spread this movement across the country. How did this process get started? Well, Luke Simons, brand new elected legislator, said that he really wanted to push a raw milk bill and, and something along the lines of food freedom in Wyoming. His campaign manager was familiar with the Wyoming law. So Luke was reaching, was searching through people and trying to think of groups that he knew that would have an interest. He got a hold of the North Dakota Grazing Lands Coalition, which is very big about sustainable agriculture, and said to that group, do you know people who would be interested in the food freedom movement? And that group contacted myself and several others, and uh, that's how we made the connection with Representative Simon. And it's just been, you know, this was his first piece of introduced legislation and, and where he put his heart and soul into it. So he just made a commitment that this is the bill I wanted to get passed, and he did it. So it takes strong leadership to bring this kind of law into reality. You know, absolutely. Those of us on the outside, we have a, we can do, we can make all the contacts that we want. We can write all the testimony that we want. But it comes down to having that elected person that's there in the committee meeting that's got it and has a vote and has a voice with debate on the, on the floor and can one-on-one -on -one make contacts with his or her fellow legislators. I mean, you have to have that commitment. And we were lucky enough not only to have Representative Simons, but we had some sponsors who were very committed and then going into committee hearings, we had some committee members that that really sat down and worked with us and said, "Okay, we've been we've been talking to other committee members. We think we got a problem with this. What can we do to make it more palatable? How do we how do we address this?" I mean, we actually had strategy sessions with um, several legislators before a committee hearing and talk about what does this section of legislation mean and how do you interpret this. And they were willing to, to spend time doing the research on foodborne illness and on labeling and things to make it work. So, uh, you know, outside people are great, but you've got to have that inside legislative person who's really willing to push this. 
how will you be educating producers and consumers in North Dakota about the new food freedom law? We do have a website. It's still in the process of being revamped um, now that we actually have a law. It's ndfoodfreedom.com. We have an active Facebook page that, again, is North Dakota Food Freedom. We are in the process of making labels that will say this product is is uh, something is is a part of the North Dakota Food Freedom Law, and you know it is not inspected, it's not processed. You know it's going to have all the little disclaimer stuff that's supposed to be on there, but we're going to make those available to people who are using processed foods or anything sold under here that would require a label, and um, and we put together quite a. Uh, group of people from the Sustainable Ag Society and also Farmers Markets Associations, and we're, we've been talking with them about educating their members. We've got information for their newsletters, and we'll be hitting the press here now starting the 1st of July, why we will have quite a press campaign in the state. How would you describe yourself? <laughs> I, you know, I'm a, I'm a little dairy producer that had some experience with legislation and lobbying and uh, Love my dairy goats and would prefer to be on the farm, but sometimes you have to, you just are in the in a position where you need to step forward and, and help lead a movement. They needed a spokesperson, and I kind of got delegated, I guess. Tell me about your farm. I run a herd share program with my dairy goats. So I, people buy a share in one of my goats, and then they get milk and or cheese. I make that with it. Um, and then everything else that's processed on our farm is basically for home use. How long has North Dakota had a herd share law? We've had a herd share law for four years. And we knew that we didn't want to lose the herd share law and we didn't want changes in the herd share law. So when it came down to can you keep raw milk in and have a whole bunch of restrictions or, you know, do you take raw milk out of food freedom and just go from you know, and leave the her existing herd share rule in place, it was pretty easy for those of us in the herd share movement to say, leave our herd shares alone. We're working with it. It's a clunky program, but we can make it work. For additional information about food freedom, you may wish to contact the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund, farm to consumer dot org. Also, you may wish to read the companion article to this podcast, available at healthimpactnews.com.